This is a 1987 Aston Martin Lagonda, and it is one of the strangest cars ever made. It looks like an anteater. The interior is insane. It's a four-door Aston Martin, which is weird in itself, and this car cost $170,000 back in 1987, which translates to $370,000 in today's money. It also just happens to be one of my all time favorite cars because it is just so weird and so rare that it's just cool. Today I'm going to take you on a tour of it. I borrowed this Lagonda from Auto Sport Designs here on Long Island in New York. They have an incredible inventory of just about every vintage and cool exotic car you can imagine. Aston Martin DB5s, Ferraris, Bentleys, there's an F50 in the showroom right now. But when they reach out and asked if there was anything that they had in their inventory that I might want to review, it was simple. The Lagonda. I want the Lagonda. And that's obvious to anyone who knows anything about this car. The Lagonda came out in 1976 and it was weird from day one. It was tremendously wide and flat. I always felt, truly, it resembles an anteater. <laughs> It was pointy in front for some reason. The interior is just crazy. And while people considered this car ugly, I never thought that. I always thought it was cool. It was different. It was unusual, for better or worse. But there's more to this car than its appearance. You might be wondering, for instance, why Aston Martin was making a four-door sedan. But that's not as unusual as you think. Although Aston is known for coupes and convertibles, they made a sedan, the Lagonda Rapide, in the 60s. They made this throughout the 1970s and 1980s and they currently sell a four-door sedan, the Rapide, which has been on the market for almost a decade now. Aston Martin even recently sold an ultra-luxury sedan called the Lagonda Taraf in foreign markets, but it didn't come to North America. So we've covered the obvious things. It's a sedan, and it's weird looking, but there is oh so much more than that. Starting with price, yes, $170,000 back then, $370,000 when you account for inflation, which made this one of the most expensive sedans you could buy in the 1980s. Under the hood, there is a 5.3 liter V8, which made around 300 horsepower and around 300 pound-feet of torque, and all Lagondas had an automatic transmission. This car weighs about 4,400 pounds, and it's 208 inches long. Compare that to a standard city car at the time, the Volkswagen Golf, and this was four feet longer. The Lagonda was sold all the way through 1990, and there were four versions of it. This is a Series 3 model, and I would love to review all the other versions at some point because they are all a different level of weird. Anyway, I don't usually talk that much at the start of my videos, but this car has a lot to introduce, and there's also a lot to show you. So today I'm going to show you around the Lagonda and show you its many quirks and features. Then I'm going to get it out on the road and drive it, and then I'm going to give it a Doug score. And for more of my thoughts on the Lagonda experience, click the link below to visit autotrader.com oversteer, where I've also compiled a list of the weirdest Aston Martin models in the brand's history. I'm going to start with the screens. Ah, yes, the screens. You know how in your car you have a speedometer, a tachometer? Well, this car has old school screens. Turn it on and they give off this greenish glow, like an old radar system or television from the 1980s. This was cutting edge back then. Of course, this is how modern infotainment systems are going to look in 30 years. They're going to feel exactly this outdated. Now, once the screens are on, you can see what they do. The one on the left is a little bit wonky. That's to be expected, of course, given its age. That shows your speed. The one in the middle shows what gear you're in and various other features like fuel and the car's engine temperature. And the one on the right shows the engine speed, the revolutions per minute. And check this out. I press the gas pedal and yes, the RPMs climb on this old school stream like you're playing a game of Pong. It is incredible to see this. This was probably the most cutting edge thing Aston could think of 30 years ago. And now it's just hilarious. And yes, like I showed you with the RPMs, these screens are reactive. 
interactive. For example, if you turn on the headlights, you can see that the little headlight icon turns on in the screen to let you know they're on, just like the little headlight light would light up in your car's gauge cluster. Naturally, the screens do have a few shortcomings. For one, they're obviously incredibly outdated looking, but that's not all. They don't show the turn signals. You put on the turn signal and the screens don't show it. Instead, it just makes the turn signal sound and you have to sort of know that the turn signals are on and which turn signal is on. Also, the screens don't show the odometer, which is interesting. This car does have an odometer, but it isn't there. We'll get to that in a minute. Next, we move on from the screens to the left where there is this giant flat switch panel with an enormous number of switches that the driver can control. I want to start the discussion of the switch panel by talking about the font. You can see the font that they've chosen is like that 1980s radio font, which seemed very futuristic at the time, but of course now looks hilariously outdated. It's like they were trying to be high tech. Now, obviously everything in that switch panel is weird, starting with the climate controls, which are on the top half. There are seven different climate control settings. There's low, high, auto. Those are normal. The weird one is the off setting is actually labeled standby. There's no off. It just is called standby. There's also a little dial to the left of the climate control switch that you can use to change the temperature. There's red for hot, blue for cool, and then there's green. I don't know what kind of air that gives you. Green air? Never seen that as an option in a vehicle before. Now below that, we move on to the headlights, which are rather unusual in this car. I'm going to cover the headlights on the outside in a minute, but first let's talk about the switches themselves. There are four of them. Now the one on the left turns on sort of the driving lights. You press that and it lights up the entire switch panel with these little red lights because now it's nighttime, it thinks, and so now you can see where all your switches are. Then the next three lights control various different lights in the car. There's the full headlights, there's a different set of auxiliary driving lights, and then there's yet a another set of auxiliary driving lights, all controlled by these light switches. Now, the next switch is the rear window heater. And you notice I didn't say the rear window defroster, and that's because the rear window is actually heated. It has heating coils running through it. You get ice on it, you press that little button, and then it will just melt the ice right off. Now, the next switch is probably the most interesting, and that's the one marked bonnet, which is, of course, British English for hood, the thing that covers the engine in front. Now, it's not all that unusual that there's a switch for that. The weird thing is that there's no trunk release. There's only a hood release on that switch panel. In fact, there's no trunk release in the interior of the car at all. You have to walk back there with the key to open the trunk. It's also weird because the hood release is placed directly next to your headlights and your fuel door release. So you go to open your fuel door or turn on your headlights and suddenly you've opened your hood, which is not really a good situation. So when you're over there, you better look at what you're doing. Now, interestingly, you saw that the little screen could say boot open and let me know that the trunk is open open if I've accidentally forgotten to close it, but it won't tell you if the hood is open. So in other words, the interior of this car will let you open the hood and tell you if your trunk is open, but it won't let you open your trunk or tell you if your hood is open. Now, next to the switch mark bonnet, you have the switch that opens the fuel door, except in this car, you'll notice there's two of them. There's one marked L fuel and there's one marked R fuel. That's because this car has two fuel doors. Press L fuel and the fuel door on the left pops open and you can open it up. Press R fuel and the fuel door on the right pops open and you can open it up. Now, interestingly, the fuel doors are located in the C pillar right here between the rear windows, which is sort of an odd placement. Maybe even stranger is the fact that it's hinged on top. So you open up your fuel door like this and then you stick the fuel pump here and you can pump gas. Now, you might be wondering, it has two fuel doors, does it have two fuel tanks? The answer to that is no. It just gave you the option of going to the gas pump on whichever side you preferred. But anyway, back inside and back to the switches. On the far right of that switch panel, you will see two dials. The dial on top controls the wiper speed. So if you turn on your intermittent wipers, you can adjust how fast they wipe using that dial. The dial on bottom is your dimmer, and you can use it to dim the dash lights and your screens. The next we move on to the steering wheel. There are a couple of interesting items on the steering wheel, but this is not the most interesting steering wheel this car came with. The Series 2 Lagonda models had the weirdest steering wheel of all time and had a single pillar that came out from the middle and connected to the steering wheel on the bottom. Unfortunately, Aston Martin ditched that beautiful design for the Series 3 and we got this more conventional wheel instead, but there are still some quirks. One is the fact that the steering wheel says Lagonda in the middle of the steering wheel and not Aston Martin. In fact, 
fact, if you look all around this car, it only says Lagonda. The front grille, the rear, the little Lagonda badges on the fuel doors, even the owner's manual only says Lagonda. Aston Martin was trying to revive Lagonda as an ultra high-end luxury sedan brand to sort of complement their sports car brand, and so it was trying to be something a little different, even though everybody knew they were linked. As a result, this car wasn't technically the Aston Martin Lagonda, even though that's how history remembers it. Instead, at the time, it was just supposed to be called the Lagonda. Now, next up, we move on to the right of the steering wheel, where there's another flat switch panel, and where you will notice another Lagonda logo for some reason. Now, this flat switch panel contains a couple of interesting things, one of which is the clock setter. Now, I made the mistake of pressing the clock button, thinking it would just bring up the clock or change it to 24-hour time. Actually, you press clock, it adjusts the clock by an hour in the screen. Or at least, that's what's supposed to happen. What actually happened is I pressed clock, and it changed the hour a few times, like it should, and then it changed the time to 9.68 p.m. Then 10.68 p.m. and right on through to some other great times like 4.68 a.m. Eventually I pressed the button to change the minutes and it went back to normal time that actually exists. Now next up in the switch panel there's a button marked TRST. I have absolutely no idea what this button does. And I've consulted the owner's manual. Unfortunately, the owner's manual, even though it says it's for a Series 3 Lagonda, which was a short production run, it has a completely different dashboard that it explains. So I have no idea what that does, and we'll never find out. The button on the right of that, however, is labeled C Horn, and I know what that does. Check this out. The car has a normal horn. Take a listen. But if you press C horn, it changes the note of the horn. Take another listen. At the time, this was called a town and country horn. There was one horn you would use around town to honk at people, and then one horn that sort of projected farther that maybe you would use in the country. The thing I like about it is it can make it seem like two people are honking. If you're really frustrated at someone, you want them to move, you can really get their attention with two different notes of horn. Check it out. Now, the next switch says MPH KMH, and that's an easy one. It just changes the screen on the left from displaying miles per hour to displaying kilometers per hour. That screen, like I said, is a little wonky, so it's hard to tell, but you can see it's changing from MPH to KMH. Now, the switches to the right of that say delete and verify. Again, I have no idea what these do. I imagine some message comes up in the screens and you can use these buttons to verify that you've read the message or to delete the message altogether. Now below delete and verify, you can see three switches labeled off, engage, and resume. Obviously this was cruise control and it works just like cruise control in your car. Off turned it on or off, engage, engage the speed, and resume would send you back to the speed you had previously set. But below those switches, there are a couple of other interesting ones. There's a blue switch with a snowflake on it and there's a red switch with a triangle on it. The red switch with the triangle is obvious. That's the hazard lights. You push it, it lights up, and obviously the hazards turn on. The blue switch with the snowflake is different. That one sends max air conditioning into the cabin. Oddly, it's nowhere near the rest of the climate control switches, but I looked it up in the owner's manual. That one is in there, and that's what it does. Next up, moving on from the switch panel, which, by the way, is only within reach of the driver. If you're the passenger and you want to control the climate controls, too bad. You'll have to ask the driver nicely. But anyway, moving on from the switch panel, we now move into the center console where you will see 10 switches. They are all the exact same size, the exact same shape, and they have the exact same diagrams on them. Two arrows, one pointing up and one pointing down. 10 switches all unlabeled so you don't know what is what. Well, it turns out that the four switches in the front control the power windows and they're arranged to correspond to each power window. And just in case you've wanted to know, the rear window in the Lagonda goes down most of the way, but not quite all of the way. That's a little Cars and Coffee trivia for you if you ever happen to see one of these. Now, the six switches further back in the center console control the seats. But because they are unlabeled and the same size and the same shape, it's impossible to know what they do unless you start playing with them. As it turns out, the front one moves the seat forward or backwards, the middle one moves the seat up and down, and the rear one moves 
the backrest forward or backwards. The other interesting thing here in the middle is this gear lever, which is just sort of ridiculous. First off, it looks like a fine high-end wine bottle stopper. The other interesting thing about it is there's no indication down here in the center console which gear you're in as you are shifting it into drive or into reverse. For that, you have to look in the screen in the center and it shows what gear you're in, which means you better hope those screens are working or else you could drive for a while in low instead of drive and you would have absolutely no idea. Next up, moving on to the rest of the quirks in the front of this car. This car has no glove box, which is not really a problem considering that Aston Martin gives you a rather large center console. And your center console even has a lock on it so it can function exactly like a glove box. And speaking of storage, you can see in the middle that this car has an aftermarket radio and right above that there's a little compartment, which is obviously a storage compartment, or is it? Open the lid and it's actually the fuse box, which is for some reason placed right in the middle of the dashboard where you would expect the radio to be. I've never really seen that, but maybe Aston figured you'd have to access that quite a bit. Also, another interesting quirk, you'll notice if you look up here by the rear view mirror, there are no map lights up there. Well, that's because Aston Martin has placed the map lights up here above the seat headrest behind your head, and the lights kind of move around like an air conditioning vent on an airplane. You can sort of move them and position them to point exactly on the map that you're reading as you drive down the street. It's actually not that bad of an idea to have them up there. I kind of like it. And next up, we move on to the sun visors, which are just hilarious. You drop the sun visors just like normal. Every other car is similar. The passenger side has a mirror. That's nice. But when you want to move the sun visors over to the side to shield you from sun coming in on the side, well, you unhook them and then they move right into your face. You see, the hinge that they're on doesn't actually allow them to move over and black out the sun on the side of your face like every other sun visor. Instead, they move over, but they also move down. So they come forward towards you and then they sort of finish haphazardly blocking the sun diagonally across that window. It is absolutely hilarious. In a $370,000 car, Aston Martin couldn't figure out side sunshades. Next up on the seats themselves, you can see these seats are nice and plush leather with red piping, pretty standard. The interesting thing about them is they don't just have a headrest, they also have an additional headrest pillow mounted on top of the headrest for extra headrest comfort. And next up, moving on to the driver's door panel, you have a couple of interesting quirks, one of which is the mirror controls. There's just these two unlabeled sort of sticks coming out from the door panel, and you use them to control the mirrors. Obviously, it doesn't say which one is left or right. That's just something you have to figure out in time with your Lagonda. The other interesting thing on the driver's door panel is the door lock, which is one of the strangest I've seen. You sort of press it forward and backward to lock and unlock the door. And neither side really explains whether it's locked or unlocked. That's another thing you sort of have to figure out in time. And another interesting item in that vicinity, the parking brake for this car is not in the center console. That, of course, would conflict with the rows of unlabeled switches. Instead, the parking brake is located to the left of the driver's seat between the driver's seat and the driver's door. Now, next up, we move on to the owner's manual. And obviously, a Lagonda owner's manual is a quirk gold mine. But I'm going to try to not geek out too much and just keep it to a couple of interesting items, one of which this is the service voucher pamphlet. And you can see that the first service was free for this car, and the owner never redeemed that first free service. The free service voucher is still there. We should take this thing to Aston Martin of Long Island and demand a free first service that we never got. Next up, the owner's manual itself. There are a couple of interesting items in here, one of which is on page 25. It's explaining what all those switches in the center do. Seat up, down. Seat backrest up, down. It also says seat squabs up, down. I think that might be a British term. I'm not quite sure what a seat squab is, but if you press that particular button, it moves it up and down. I also like the fact that on page 29, a nice British man demonstrates how to use the seat belts. I bet this guy told his friends for like 30 years, yes, I'm a man from the Lagonda owner's manual. Yes, that was me they used the owner's I, I demonstrated the seat belt in the Lagonda. Yes, yes, quite nice. Do you like to see the pictures? Here they are, right there. Yes, yes, of course. Another interesting item in the owner's manual, the appendices on the very last page 
page under a section marked visits, it says in one sentence, owners and enthusiasts are welcome to visit our establishment at Greenwich, Connecticut. It doesn't say where that establishment is located in Greenwich. It doesn't say what time it's open. It doesn't say what you do there. It just gives you that one sentence kind of implying we don't really want you to come by, but you know, we got to put this in anyway because we got to be nice. Now next, another interesting item regarding this car, you can now see there is a giant folder sitting on top of me and that is every service record going back for years. It is incredible how much work has been done to this car and the owner saved them all. It's organized in tabs by year, of course. The owner was so meticulous that he even saved fuel receipts from decades ago. I'm looking at a fuel receipt from a Speedway in Bloomfield Hills, Michigan from April of 2004. Back then, gas was only $1.91 a gallon. Now, next up, we move on to the rear seats. And getting into the rear seats is actually surprisingly difficult. Owing to this car's unusual design, the rear door doesn't really open that far, and it's sort of angled toward you. And so getting into the back is actually kind of a contortionist act, which stuns me. It's very difficult to climb back here, which is something that would have upset me if I had spent $370,000 on my Aston Martin luxury sedan. But now I'm in back, and it's not really particularly roomy back here, also owing to this car's design. You can see I'm sitting here in a normal place. This front seat is in a normal spot, and my knees are butting up against it, which is not what I would expect from a $370,000 luxury sedan. But anyway, there are a number of interesting quirks in the back, as you might expect. I'm going to start with the shaggy carpeting. This car has this nice cream interior with red accents. It has red shaggy carpeting back here. And I'm sure it felt very nice 30 years ago when this car came out, but obviously it has worn over the years. Mostly it's just funny to see red carpeting in a car like this. Now the next interesting item is that the window controls for the rear passengers to roll down the rear windows, those controls are located down here at the back of the front center console. Why didn't they put them on the doors? Well, they just didn't. So you had to reach down and roll down the windows. Now, that wouldn't be especially interesting except for the fact that this car has rear climate control. If you open up this little cubby above the windows, you can see there is a little dial to adjust your air, how much air is getting back here. And that makes you wonder, because in most cars with rear climate control, the vents are right here at the back of the front center console. But in this car, they put the window controls there. So where exactly is the air vent? that you can control in that cubby. Why, that would be behind you. There is an air vent on the parcel shelf behind the rear seats, and if you turn up your air, air conditioning blows on you from the back to cool you down, which is something I've never really seen before in any sedan. Here's another insane rear seat detail in this car. This car has a rear sunroof. It does not have a front sunroof. So the front passengers get no sunroof, the rear passengers get the sun exposure. Now unfortunately that rear sunroof does not open. It is merely a fixed panel of glass and if you're sitting in the back you can just look at it and you can look out and see the world. Or if you don't want to see the world, it has a sunshade but not like you'd expect. Instead it has individual rear sunshades, one for each passenger, that slide across the sunroof in order to block the sun. But of course they don't block all the sun. They block some of the sun, they're just mesh. The sun can still get through it. And even if you have both rear sunshades in place, there's still a strip down the middle that isn't covered. So if you're sitting back here, you're gonna get sun from that sunroof. You have no choice in the matter. Another interesting item, like many luxury cars at the time period and now, there is a rear center armrest. You pull this little leather tab and then the center armrest extends and you can put your arms on it. It's worth noting there is no middle seat in this car. There are only two rear seats, two sets of seat belts back here. So even when that center armrest is up, the middle area can't be used as a seat. Another interesting item, the rear bench seat in this car is unusually narrow. It stops like eight inches short of hitting the door panel, and so it's not particularly wide, which is weird. If you're a larger person, you might be wondering, where's the rest of the seat? Interestingly, possibly to cover up for this, Aston Martin has placed a little leather pad between the seat and the door to make up that lost space that would otherwise just be sort of a no man's land in that area. 
area. I'm not sure why they didn't just make the seat wider, but it was Aston Martin. Next, we move on to the outside of the Lagonda, where we have to discuss the headlights. Now, first you can see that they are pop-up headlights. You press the little light switch inside and the lights pop up, and suddenly the anteater can see. But the fact that they are pop-up headlights is not the most unusual thing about them. That honor goes to the sheer number of lights. Remember I showed you all those auxiliary light switches inside? Well, they correspond to one, two, three, four, five different white headlight beams on either side. So if you have all the headlights running at once in your Lagonda, you can have 10 different lamps on while you're driving down the road. The anteater can see a lot. Next up, we move on to the engine and the hood, or the bonnet as it's called by the Brits. Now, I've already pressed that little button on the switch panel to unlatch the bonnet. Now I open it up, it is quite heavy, but you open it up and there are a couple of interesting items that you notice. One is obvious, it is front hinge, so that when it's open, you can only access it from the side. Since the hinges are in the front, you can't get to it in the front like a normal car. That isn't all that unusual. That was reasonably common in the time period. More unusual is the fact that the headlights go up when the hood is raised. Now, at the time this was legal, but it is no longer allowed. US federal regulations now say that all headlights and taillights must be fixed in place, even when the tailgate and the trunk and the hood are raised. So if Aston was selling this car today, they would have to change this design and figure out a way to get the lights fixed when the hood goes up. Another interesting thing under here, you can see that the engine block says on it, Aston Martin Lagonda. Aside from a few other spots under the hood, this is the only place where I can see that it actually says Aston Martin on it. The Lagonda shared this engine with other Aston Martin models, and maybe it wanted to bring that point home by showing you that the engine was from an Aston Martin sports car. But by far the most most interesting thing underneath this hood near the base of the windshield on the passenger side that's the odometer right there. That's right, because of the screens, the odometer isn't in the gauge cluster. I told you we'd get back to that in a minute. Well, it's been a little more than a minute, but you can see the odometer under the hood. I have never seen that before. And I know someone's gonna get on here and say, well, the 1946 Duesenberg had it under the hood. Fine, but that is really weird. And those are this car's actual miles. You wanna read the odometer, you gotta open up the hood. And then it's just displayed there like a traditional odometer as if it wasn't weird at all. Now, next up, moving on to the trunk. And I just mentioned the thing about the front headlights rising with the hood and how that would no longer fly. Well, it's even worse in the back. When you open up the trunk, all the tail lights and turn signals and reverse lights open along with it. So if you're unloading something from the side of the road in your Lagonda late at night, you open up the trunk, no one will know that you're here. You better just hope you don't get hit. Now, interestingly, even though Aston Martin wasn't quite ready to comply with the regulations saying that all taillights and headlights must be on a fixed piece of bodywork, they did have to comply with another US regulation, and that was the third brake light. Right around the time this car was built, 86, 87, the US government mandated that all cars had to have third brake lights. This car obviously wasn't designed for it, and you can tell, Aston Martin stuck a third brake light in there with like a piece of tape and a wire, and you can see just how janky of a solution this was, even though you were spending this kind of money on an Aston Martin luxury sedan. Now, another interesting taillight related item, the last one, I promise, some countries did realize that it would be a problem if the taillights disappeared when the trunk went up, and so they made Aston Martin install supplementary brake lights inside the trunk that would turn on if the trunk was lifted up. And on page 33 in the Lagonda owner's manual, you can see these lights displayed how they would have been actually inside the trunk, just waiting to be used when the trunk was open. A couple of other interesting items inside the trunk. You look inside the trunk and you'll see that it's not especially large, although there is a nice low load floor since they don't have to keep the taillights fixed and they can go up when you open up the trunk. You'll also see the trunk is nicely carpeted in red with white piping to match the interior. Also interesting in the trunk, over on the left, you will see there are a couple of of little built-in items. One looks like maybe it's designed to contain the owner's manual. The other contains this large briefcase. Now, what exactly is this large briefcase? That's the tool kit. I'm not gonna open it up because when you do, the tools kind of go everywhere and it's kind of annoying, but you do get a briefcase tool kit when you buy a Lagonda. And next up, we move on to the wheels. Now, the wheel design isn't particularly unusual for 70s, 80s cars. It looked pretty normal at the time. You can see the Lagonda logo is sitting 
sitting on a little plate that covers up the lug nuts. Now that also is not that unusual. A lot of cars had their lug nuts covered back then. The weird thing about this one is it requires a key to get that little plate off to access the lug nuts. You have to insert a key in that little keyhole and only then can you take the plate off. The idea was for security so other people couldn't steal your wheels or tires, but I bet a lot of angry Laganda owners found themselves on the side of the road trying to remember where they put that key when they had a flat tire. And so those are the mini quirks of the Aston Martin Laganda. Now it's time to get it out on the road and see how it drives. All right, driving the Laganda. The first thing you notice is that the pedals are kind of offset and the brake pedal I revved the engine a couple times thinking I was pressing the brake pedal when I wasn't. The gas pedal is kind of far over to the right. And on the road in the Laganda, I've always wanted to do this my entire life. The steering wheel is way too small <laughs> given the size of this vehicle. Oh, this is great. Driving down the road, looking at those screens like a late 70s, 80s video game. <laughs> the brake pedal feel is just horrible. You push down the brake pedal and there's an enormous amount of travel and it doesn't really slow down all that well. There is a decent amount of headroom, even though it kind of looks like on the screen like there isn't. I actually have at least a couple inches, and of course I can use one of these switches, hard to tell which one, to put my seat down. All right, I'm kind of giving it some gas here. The RPM screen is climbing. It's not fast. It was surely fast back then. I mean, it's not like it's lost a lot of power. It's got to have many miles on it, but standards have changed. That's, that's the difference. If I saw one of these on the road, and I don't think I ever have before, I would just lose it. I would absolutely lose it. Like seeing an Enzo or an F50 or a Veyron. I'd flip or I'd turn around, I'd follow the guy, I'd scream at him. If I saw a Veyron, I think I'd get less excited than if I saw one of these. Like, what is this car? It's just ridiculous in every capacity. It drives reasonably well. This one feels very, very smooth. And I can tell when I'm starting it up and stuff in the video, it feels very smooth. This one is fuel injected. The later cars were. The carbureted ones, I imagine, are a little bit more difficult to keep going. It's reasonably comfortable. Going over those train tracks, going over some rough roads earlier, it feels reasonably comfortable, but it's certainly no Rolls Royce. Um, it doesn't have that level of comfort. And, and yet it's not all that fast, so I'm not really sure what Aston was trying to go for. The thing I think the main benefit of this car today is it's just so unusual. Rolls Royces from this period are literally a dime a dozen. You can buy one for five grand. But this thing, Nobody has one of these. Yeah, the steering is actually quite a bit more direct than I was expecting. The car feels nimbler than I thought, and it doesn't feel wide on the road. I'm actually surprised. Um, it definitely handles much better than I was thinking it would. The body roll is there, but not dramatically. The steering thickness is there, but not like most 80s cars I've driven. It's better than that. Um, the transmission is a weak point. I mean, four-speed autos with torque converters in today's world, we just laugh at that. Aston's from the 60s are all very valuable now. Um, this one hasn't had its day yet, although it is going up. I was looking at auction results and I noticed in 09, some of them were selling for 20, 30. This one's for sale for 95. This, more and more, that's the kind of numbers they're starting to pull. This is going to be a $100,000 car soon. And someday we're going to say, remember when you could get a Laganda for a reasonable price. And so that's a 1987 Aston Martin Laganda Series 3, one of the weirdest and quirkiest cars ever built. I like all cars, but I tend to especially have a soft spot for the unusual cars, the weird ones. And if the weird car world was a country, the Laganda would be its king. And now it's time to give it a Doug score. Starting with the weekend categories and styling, I like how this car looks, but it's certainly not beautiful or even attractive. The term I'd use is striking or maybe just bizarre, and it gets a 4 out of 10. Acceleration does 0 to 60 in 8.8 .8 seconds, and it gets a 1 out of 10. Handling is fine, more secure and nimble than I was expecting, and it gets a 5 out of 10. Fun factor is low. The car is quite simply not that much fun to drive, but I have to admit there's a certain fun factor in knowing that you're piloting one of the most unusual cars ever made and it gets a 5 out of 10. Finally, there's cool factor and this one is undeniable. I consider it one of the all-time coolest vehicles and it gets a 10 out of 10 for a total weekend score of 25 out of 50. Next up are the daily categories starting with features. The Laganda must have been very advanced for 1987, but today it's almost laughably outdated and it gets a 3 out of 10. Comfort is fine. The seats are nice, but rear seat room is poor and it gets a 6 out of 10. Quality is mixed. The interior is okay, but I can only imagine what it'd be 
like to maintain the car in time, the electronics, the screens, you saw the giant folder of service records, it gets a 4 out of 10. Practicality is only okay, the trunk is decent size, but the back seats are small and it gets a 5 out of 10. Finally, there's value, and it depends on what you want. I think this car is underappreciated and it justifies its price tag, but many people probably still think it's weird and it'll certainly be pricey to own. It gets a 6 out of 10 for a total daily score of 24 out of 50. Add it up and the Doug score is 49 out of 100, and here's a comparison next to some other odd cars of its era, but there's really no comparison because the Lagonda is, quite simply, the weirdest of them all. Mm -hmm.